Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am Guillermo Varela from Magnil Europe and I'm here with the Link IO team, the computational design department in Link Architecture, Matias and Fabian. Matias is an architect and engineer and he's an expert in daylight simulations, facade designs and computational design. And Fabian is an architect with a background as developer and he is currently developing the internal and external tools that are used at Link Architecture. They are going to present how they connect multidisciplinary design and engineering tools through Rhino and Grasshopper. They will show us their new plugin, Link Dashboards, to show how they bring typical late phase knowledge into early phase sketching, connecting other tools like Speckle and One Click LCA. I will share the link to download in the chat in a moment, but you can also download it from Rhino directly using the package manager. Remember that in the last 15 minutes of this webinar, we will have some time for Q uh, questions and answers. So you can ask questions for them in the chat and we will check them at, uh, at the end. Also, I would like to mention that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel where you can find more webinars and tutorials. I want to thank Matthias, Fabian and Jan for accepting our invitation and for all the work they have put into this plugin. That's all from my side, so you can start with the presentation if you are ready. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me see if I can get this to work. Yeah. Like that. There's a background and there's a slide. So thank you, Giuliano, a lot for inv inviting us. I'll present uh, together with Fabian here today, and um, yeah, I think it'll be really funny. So Link Architecture, for those of you who do not know who we are, we are a big Scandinavian company. We uh, specialize very much in hospital uh, architecture, but also do a lot of uh, uh, dwellings and uh, residential areas. In the um, Link IO team, we are sort of uh, spread around in our different com uh, offices. Um, so a lot of our work, and our, a lot of our work are doing project consultancy, but also maintaining what we call sort of a Link IO influencer network, which is our ambassadors out in uh, all of our offices. We also have uh, our, let's say, uh, back office running uh, with a lot of uh, development, mainly here in, uh, in Rhino and Grasshopper. And we are connecting with uh, a lot of simulation tools, as you can see on the left, uh, and, and model exchange um, tools. And we also uh, co-developing together with our internal BIM um, team. Since we are not sitting together, a lot of our work is being done on, on Miro and uh, on the GitHub planner. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, COVID hasn't really changed how we work because we are used to working this way. Um, Link has sort of seen that Consultancy can now be not only, you know, paid by the hour, but it's also you pay per product or pay per value. So that's why we're also developing uh, workflows that will help, um, let's say, optimize our workflows and uh, be faster and delivering value for our clients. We have a lot of uh, bigger development tracks going on in the company. Uh, so the left, we have Link Compass, for instance, which is a web app that you can use to facilitate uh, workshops with your clients where people can vote and suggest uh, sustainability um, uh, goals. Um, we have Agiliate, which is a room program generation through surveys. And then we have uh, our LCA guesstimator, Link EP and Roomulator. We'll talk about these today. And we also have later phase stuff that we won't be touching on today. We do, however, do bespoke tools in, in all phases. So I'll introduce for you sort of the concept of what we call Link EP, Link Early Phase. And we focus so much developing it that we didn't focus on giving it a new name. But imagine if you structure it in a way where you uh, create a building and then you have nested objects into it. So all EP objects can have uh, nested EP objects. So inside the building, you can create a room. And inside the room, you can have other rooms and you can continue. So in your own abstraction level, you can uh, pretend that a room is either uh, a department if you're planning a hospital or 
a floor in an uh, uh, apartment rise, or it could be a room. And inside the rooms, we can then have objects such as windows, balconies, and so on. So this is taking terms we kind of know from, um, let's say, BIM and late phase and trying to put it into early phase to give some of the outputs that we are very focused on. Um, we uh, have put a lot of uh, effort in designing all of these classes. And I think we'll touch more on, uh, let's say, the details of that uh, later. Um, but when we have all those things structured, for instance, we can uh, add a rule set for each apartment to check if it's compliant with, let's say, a Norwegian uh, daylight requirement, because we can connect to the room and we can associate it with the room above. Then, as we see it here to the right, we can then uh, find out at the uh, apartment above uh, balcony area to your floor area in, in, in your room, for instance. Uh, and all of this stuff, it's much more easy now that we have a, a structured uh, data. This allows us also to visualize when we are calculating, let's say, backwards in the Norwegian daylight rule. So we can look into how uh, how much area do we need to subtract from our buildings. So when you're sitting with a, a developer and you try to squeeze in the areas and so on, we can quickly visualize what are the consequences of building this close and, and how many apartments should we take away in, in, in the upper floors. I will uh, give the word to Fabian, who will be introducing a, a big um, master plan that we are currently working on. Yep. Thank you. Let's steal the screen. So this project is called Leerstranda is in uh, Norway. And here we are looking at how EP can uh, help with the massing studies done on this. So as in Are you sharing screen, EP, screen uh, Fabian? Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this is the project, and uh, here we have the the EP framework. And uh, just as Matthias explained, we have the different building blocks. Right now, we're creating buildings because we want to do the initial massing studies, and we take them all, uh, sort them into different functions, and then we can start to do operations on them. And for a massing study, we need to do a very simple operation. We just want to divide them. So if we check out the uh, area over here, we can see that we have the division lines all done for all of these. And all the time during this process, we can evaluate and see that everything looks nice and correct. And when we're looking at a large project like this, let's see if we shouldn't make the dashboards a bit bigger. You can see that we have 1.1 million square meters up here. So it's, uh, it's, it's huge. But still, every building stack. So here we can see a smaller building stack, which has the function of bowling, which is housing and uh, commercial. And it splits and sorts them into the correct floors. But I think we can um, sort this up a bit better so that we can see it more cleanly. And then we can create plots as well. So hiding here. We can see that we have one plot for each of these areas of uh, buildings, these groups of buildings, and they are delimited. So we have the plot, and then we can either input buildings directly into this and build them up from by ourselves if we would know the tree structure, or we can just use an um, auto connect, which we will do here. And all the time we can set new parameters here. So now we want to look at MUA, but we can do. Um, you can add different metrics here all the time so that you can sort of build up the structure of your of your file. And, and the MOA is, is the minimum outdoor area required by code. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, since it's a Norwegian project, we will look at some Norwegian metrics uh, for this one. And that's, that's a large one in, um, in Norway. So if we connect this guy here, now we have uh, the plots coming in. We have all the buildings. We have a max distance. This is null, so we're using the default one. And out we get all the plot indexes per building, so we can start to group them. And underneath each plot, we can see each building stack. And if we expand that one, you can see the floors again. But and, and here we can just hook it up to this guy instead, and we can do some uh, nifty 
Python just to close all these guys. Oh, Fabian, by the way, you can just right click in the dashboard on plot in the top left corner and then say expand or collapse. But if you say um, collapse all uh, nested. These are not nested. It's uh, oh. one uh, one. Big. Ah, that's why. That's why. OK, sorry. So we just go. And here we can see all the different methods that we can do with this. And let's close all of these. And it's all closed. And now let's find the plot that we looked at before. Here we go. And we can find that building again. And the exact same floors. You can also right click on the on the floor and say zoom selected in the Rhino viewport. And then we find it. Yeah. So that's uh, perfect. But what can we do with this? So we have all the divisions and uh, we have all the, the kind of the metrics that we want to look at. So uh, let's take uh, an area and zoom in a bit. So I've, I've already identified a problem area, which I know we will have some problems with. So I'm uh, constructing some new buildings. And we can see it's just this, this area. Uh, let's select just these guys. And we can do some uh, quick uh, daylight studies on this. So here we are again. Now we can just choose the, the height that we want to divide it on. It's made for three meters. So that's perfect. And here we are just creating some dummy windows for the for all the rooms inside of this building. And uh, we can quickly show all the rooms here. So it's we're adding for the building, we're adding rooms underneath, which are the floor divisions. And then if we deconstruct this one more time, we should find all our windows underneath here. Yeah, and now we can see that we have a series of windows that is hosted inside of this building. So all the time we can go and deconstruct this to move downwards in this structure of a building, then a room, and then a window. Or it can be nested rooms within each other. But all the time we can double check this either by deconstructing them and just previewing them or by plugging in them to, uh, to a dashboard where we can see. Oh, no. Let's go see. This is the one I wanted to. where we can see all the rooms. And here we can see all the windows that it's hosted underneath this. So for Nor Norway, there is a very easy calculation. That is, if a window has a 45 degree and it hits something from that, uh, it fails the room automatically. And then it has a lot of other um, like takes other things in account where it calculates the, the room area uh, towards the window glass, but the 45 degrees is like a hard rule. So we can directly see that these two buildings will be problematic since they're too close to the others. And this can be done in, in any scale, but we can just simply move these guys. Oh, not enough. Let's move it a bit more. And let's, let's move this guy. And let's see if we can fix our problems here. Yeah, perfect. But so this is kind of the, the easy way to do it, the, the quick way. But we can also maybe do something more fun. Matthias, you showed something uh, on your LinkedIn some time ago, where, uh, or three days ago, where you use these lines to, um, to remove from the buildings next to each other, next to it and kind of highlight how much, how much area would get lost from these division lines if you would remove from these buildings instead of just uh, moving the buildings themselves. And for that, we need uh, windows that are, that are hosted inside of these objects. So now we have all these windows. Let's just do for these two problematic buildings that we know will create a problem. So let's just go YouTube and all the windows will disappear for the rest. And now we have our windows. Let's plug it in. And let's just do a quick. Did you call it laser? 
yeah it's uh mm-hmm. so our, our quick daylight it's called the daylight no or dirty daylight and then this is the dirty daylight laser <laughs> <laughs> we're giving it superpowers now it can also retract from its um, the other buildings so now we can see the the actual blocks or voxels that it takes away this is using monoceros right yeah so it's using monoceros to um, see if i can't get crossover up again yeah. it's using monoceros to to remove these uh, or create these voxels and then the the line that we are getting from these to kind of remove and removing the adjacent ones and all of the above ones so you can see in the top how many uh, how many square meters it removes. Yeah. So if we wouldn't move this, we would have to remove 104 square meters of this building and 26 square meters of that one. And we have some nifty miscellaneous stuff in here as well. So we have a color palette that we always use. So we can just use that, get link colors. To create swatches, we can see we get some color list here. We create the swatches, we run it. Now we get some nice swatches directly into the... I think I deleted them. Now we can just, because the hot pink might be a bit too much for the, <laughs> for the results. Okay, looks, looks better. So now we can see uh, this. So we can do a lot of stuff through this. It's just like this nested structure is very, it's very good for making quick analysis for it. So let's hide these guys and disable this. And we can do another thing that's very important for the, um, the, the Norwegian rules is on the minimum outdoor area, the MOA. And since we have plots and we have buildings, let's change it up a bit and We'll only do for this, this problematic area that we had before. And I'll just remove all the other plots, except this one. So now we will only have one plot and one building, just so that we know. So we have our, do, do, do. we have to get back our plot buildings. And we're mapping these to the plots so we can see through the dashboard that we now have a plot with four buildings underneath, which it's have uh, square meters. And from this, we can do um, plot metrics. This can be done on a, a larger scale if we wanted to. So we could check it for all the plots and just I can quickly show you how the output looks. So we're basically getting aggregated BTA. So the, these are the actual floor plan area. This is the total area. This is the footprint. Then we have uh, how much of the plot we're using. But the two important ones for here is usage, apartments. And right now we're just using a factor. But depending on how much, how detailed the model is, we will take a look more into like, when we start splitting floors we can actually use the actual apartments inside. But right now we're just using a factor since we don't have any apartments inside. So the nesting structure isn't detailed enough. And we can just run our uh, MUA check, which basically uh, takes all this into account and the requirement we set before, which was 25 times that, the times of apartments. And we can get uh, a check if, um, if our MOA is valid. I think I, I have a too large terrain. So basically the valid minimum outdoor area in Norway is, is including places with X amount of sunlight hours and a slope less than something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not getting the correct uh, cut here. So, but basically, what it will do is, you can see that uh, it's cutting out for the sun vectors from the buildings. Those are the jagged edges. 
and also removing the actual buildings. We're getting the whole uh, area, but uh, that's what it would do. Usually it should cut by the plot, but uh, I think the, the kind of key thing here is that our plot metrics can really show, we can start grouping stuff and start to show where we have problems in, uh, in also outer area where we might have built too much, too high ex uh, exploitation. So let's jump into a more um, detailing view of this. So same block, we have it split up. You can see that the, the buildings are now split up on uh, uh, like smaller chunks than a larger one. And we're doing the exact same thing. We're dividing it. And now we're- So your input here is, is just boxes, it's just volumes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's just these very simple B reps, which we have uh, drawn out. And these are the ones that are moved so that we, we can do the, the Norwegian daylight one is uh, compliant. And when we are splitting them, we have some options. We can select how we want to split it. If we want to do a three spanner, if we want to do a single core, how many percent of the core we want to have and uh, other things. And what we're getting out of this is let's have a dashboard show it and actually connect to the and I think I have one that is larger and we have our buildings so let's look at building C and we can see its floor let's go top floor and we can see that it's bowling and all the the three room divisions that we have and we are feeding this into Plan Finder at the moment. And Plan Finder wants some uh, facade curves. So we can see that we are giving them facade curves per apartment uh, and checking for collisions inside. They want entrance point and uh, the actual apartments that we want. And from that, we can uh, push out we get the, the actual geometry for it. And this is important because now that we want to go into more detail, so it's the same box model, but we want to do, let's say an early phase LCA on this, which we will check out. And then we, we are getting out the interior walls, the exterior walls, the glass area, and the interior room curves. So now we have a, a more structured approach to a building, like we're used to seeing it with floor plans. So let's turn you off. And by now it's maybe important to highlight, this is, is not necessarily the plans that we are building, but instead of using rule of thumb numbers on how many running meters of internal walls you have, we think having some kind of graphic preview on how does that area actually look makes us, uh, gives us, let's say, a, a graphical quality check. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always hard to do early phase um, sustainability reports on, um, on a massing level like on uh, LCA, because it's all uh, just guesses. And if we start to populate it by either, even if it doesn't make 100% sense, it's still a better way. It's still closer to reality than what we were before than using these dummy numbers. So now we can see that we are getting, uh, let's turn off the roofs. We can see that we have these extruded floor plans in here. Which, which are uh, nice. And we can also look at our, the structure of this. So we can see, I want the properties. Let's make it a bit bigger again. And let's find building C, top floor, and look at you. Then we can see the, the actual rooms inside. So they are nested. So now we have a building, which is an EP building. We have a floor, which is an, uh, an EP, like a apartment or floor or division. Then we have the room and the apartment inside. And then inside of that, we have the, the actual rooms. So the, the last step or like the, the last thing that we want to do before sending this to LCA is connect the actual windows that we extruded to it. So if we look here, we create the windows. So now we can see that we are extruding these curves. 
and creating the windows. We're using these rooms and automatically connecting them to windows. Since we don't know the exact structure of the rooms and windows, we're just pushing them into each other. And we can see that if we zoom in, we get this, uh, these lines highlighting what window got connected to what room. So we're actually seeing the actual connections here. And if we take a look at this, let's make it a bit prettier. Let's hide here for now. So we have the windows. And we can, instead of creating, we can inspect our object and create a dashboard from it. And we'll get something that looks more like we, we saw before. And floor four, let's check the same apartment. Now we're only getting the ones with windows and we can see that we have connected windows to them. So we have the structure all the way down. And uh, let's take a look at how we're sending it to Speckle and what we're doing with our LCA app that we have developed uh, in, internally. So basically we're getting all the extrusions from the curves simple using the floor heights so that we match them up then we have um, a couple of um, just creating the elements and what we need for the, the early phase lca is the, the area of stuff because we're going to project the structure backwards on it so we're taking the area of an element and then we're projecting a structure so we're projecting a build up let's say it's a wall we're estimating that it will have some insulation it will have some wood some metal studs or and so on and we will send this to speckle and i have already done this because sending to speckle will take a, a minute or so so we can take a look at the, the app and it's frozen Now it's leaving. I'll bring it back. And we will choose our branch that we sent to. We will choose our project. Let's reload it. Yeah, here we go. And we will get a 3D viewer from the model that we sent, which will be the whole project that we just detailed. We will get what different materials we have in there or what we have sent. So we have the windows, the slabs, the roofs, the walls. We're not bringing into columns or anything like that. I think we can view it here in the their, their own hosted. Maybe it's too much for the... Oh, oh well. Basically, that's just a 3D preview where you see that so that you can validate that everything is coming in correctly and that you can see that it's the right materials. But here we're just mapping these kind of structures, these buildups based on it. So we have windows, slabs, roofs, foundation. I've done some pre-mapped one, but all the time we're using one-click LCA here and connecting to that. So this is a web app that's hosted on Speckle. And using one-click LCA, we can just bring out CLT constructions we search for them, we get them all here. We just double click them to map them towards a, so let's uh, change a window. So we can do wooden windows. We know this is a quadruple glazed window. We double click it and it's now changed. And from here, we can just start a calculation now that we have our materials updated and shouldn't take more than a 10 seconds, yep. And then we're getting back the results with our CO2 values. And this is then fed into um, a dashboard where our architects can see is this below, below or above the standards and the, the kind of the dummy values. But all of this can be kind of, it's interactive graphs. But right now, if we check interior walls, we only have one type of interior walls. But would we start subdividing this that we know that the toilets are usually wet room walls? So we can start to create more informed ones based on the actual internal rooms that we're using. And this is all mapped to elements, so we can send it back. But we're not using that. Uh, it's stored in Firebase right now. 
and we are moving it to speckle so we haven't done the connection back yet but the last part in speckle which we think is really cool that uh, i want to show is just we have our all rooms and of course we can just send them to speckle so we connect our um, objects we select what stream our message and then we we send it and it will automatically convert everything to speckle objects it will grab all the relevant metrics so if we're looking at a room its area its type its function its name and it will map that create a new object and send that to um, to speckle for us hopefully we can we can look at one i've done some uh, pre-sends but it should pop up here any minute and we can see that we have the same internal rooms all mapped out oh, we need with to, all the functions we need to unweld mesh for these ones looks like bubbles yeah 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 the the edges are not that good but but still the the kind of thought is that this is then sent so it's basically a 2d program that we're sending in 3d and we can remap this later on but i think you will uh, show some on the alternative ways to build blocks matthias sure. this was kind of the automatic automatic way sure let me just grab the screen and um i can just read and 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 in the questions in the chat that there was a little bit of confusion with what we're sharing so um we'll also come back to this uh, later but the link EP development with buildings and split up and so on is something we're doing in in house and not sharing. However, the dashboard uh, pop up stuff and uh, all that is uh, something we're sharing. And, and I'll also give a demo at it at, at the end of um, at the end of the uh, webinar here. Um, so Fabian just showed how we can generate, let's say, um, automatic apartments from from volumes, um, but we can also generate EP build, uh, rooms and, and, and apartments from, uh, let's say, blocks in Rhino. So imagine you have, let me just restart this one. Imagine you're doing a block here. Let me just insert it, insert block and find it. It's called building floor. Uh -huh. Let's insert it here. Oh, where was it? Class. Okay, there's some scaling going on here. Okay, I'll take one of the other ones. I just think they are scaled weirdly because um, they stretch, so I can do block edit. But let's see. Maybe we can look into this one. So imagine you're doing, let's say, a full floor or building as a block. You want to reuse it. You want to copy it around in, in your uh, master plan. And inside that block, you can then have rooms nested so I can have an apartment one, two, three. And then within those apartments, you can then have balconies and you can have uh, rooms. In this case, we're just modeling rooms as as um, extruded B-reps. And then the naming over here can then come from the name of the blocks within it. So imagine you could have, let's say, a, a company library of the apartments that you use most often. And then you could drag and drop them from Windows Explorer into your Rhino file. If you choose to make these and they are structured in the same way, it's very, very easy to uh, then use the EP program to sort of read the blocks. So I'm using the Elefront plugin by Front Architects, I think they're called, uh, to read the blocks. And then uh, within the component, I'm basically just passing through the entire structure of the blocks so you can see that there's apartments inside. So you can see apartment C and I have the rooms within it and again, the windows here. So if I want to do just, I mean, now now we are repeating ourselves a little bit, but again, it's fast to do the, uh, let's say the Norwegian um, daylight thing here. So imagine that you have this whole library thing and you can re reuse these um, apartments. Another thing I would like to show is slightly more complex. It's a development that we're doing for 2D work. It's not necessarily a part of our uh, EV project, but it's uh, related. And that's uh, imagine, or that's uh, aiming for the phase where you say, okay, we have a room program. Let me just bring it up. 
this is a hospital. Again, we are working a lot with hospitals, so there's thousand rooms or eight hundred rooms in this one, and you want to sort of start sketching out where should you have the rooms and Rhino and so on. So with lun lunchbox, you can read all the data, and then uh, our very brilliant uh, colleague and PhD student Paul has worked on this uh, workflow that we call Roomulator, and this one basically passes all of our Excel uh, data. So you can see each column is in Excel is now a, a list here in uh, Grasshopper, and then instead of just creating zones directly, we kind of like that you can mouse over, see what is the data, and then we manually create this uh, attribute. And then we connect uh, or create what we call uh, zones. And if you want to take a look at that, then you can see in the viewport here, this is all, all of our rooms. So all of this data here is then structured. I can show later how we can structure that, but as a sort of a room tag, so we can actually uh, that's different. Here you see all the columns, so we can change this one, and you see how you want to structure it in in Rhino. But now all the rooms are very unstructured; they are just in one big uh, sort of a Rhino nesting kind of thing. So if you start by giving it a color, and we want to preview the color, then we started coloring by the zone one because in my um, Excel I had the three columns: a zone one, two, and three. So it's a function and then overall department and sub department and whatever. And if you want to continue, let's say sorting that, you can then uh, group it first by zone one and then by zone two. So you see they're sort of zone in a zone and you can continue to do this recursively to the X amount of data you want to sort things in. And then you can uh, bake it to uh, Rhino. And what this does is it, it basically, um, let's see if I can see anything here. It creates these room tags and it's a text uh, element and it has a GUID and that GUID will also bake back into Excel. So whenever you change something in Excel or if you rename or move or anything like that on the text over here, it automatically updates and, and, uh, and pass changes back and forth between Excel and, and, and Rhino because we have the GUID. Uh, let's see if this thing works. It can also read, now I'm jumping a little bit, but it can also read surfaces from Rhino. So here, usually you will use, no room later, uh, just to the question, room later is also an internal uh, project. Um, but here are linked to surfaces that we have uh, ref uh, referenced. It could also be like a pipeline to a layer in Rhino. And then we have the zone tags. That's all the baked text that I have referred to. And I can do a check here, and I can see if there's any new zones, maybe a, a, a 2D uh, surface that doesn't have a room tag, or a room that does, uh, sorry, a uh, tag that doesn't have a room, or it could also be something that exists in Rhino but does not exist in our Excel and vice versa. So you can get sort of a list of, of, of stuff missing and so on. Another cool workflow, and let's see if this works. Um, I'll just disable all this and turn this one on. Let's see. Let's start here. So I want to try and make a 3D plan, a 3D object out of our zones. So if the architect, and I can't really remember which layer it is here, but if the architect has drawn the plans down here, you can see the zone text, then we can say, okay, based on blocks, block, if this is, block is named first floor, second floor, blah, 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 and they are, let's say, located in the same way within each curve, we can start building a 3D plan or 3D building out of it. So first we, um, we match the zones, Set the colors, and then we can set the f uh, the floors. So you can see that um, inside each of each of my zones now it has a, a location and it has a floor. So if I want to draw that in 3D, let's see if we can see anything here. <laughs> okay. 
this file has to be run in meters and not millimeters. So let me just change this. And we'll just re recompute everything. Let's see if we get some nice 3D. No, not really. Okay, lost that one. Um, but we'll then be able to see it in um, in three D, and we can just as Fabian showed. Then we can uh, do various filtering, like we did on the apartments. You can do that with uh, rooms on um, on a big hospital. And we have a uh, the dashboard, and we have an export to Spiegel. I think we have. Let's see if the link is here. Let me just show this link. I only have the curves in here, but you can sort of get the idea of, of uh, how the building could look in 3D. So we're working on a way here also together with the EP project to add um, generic windows, and then we can make some daylight simulations and we can project that back into the 2D plans. So you can get sort of a uh, a feedback back and forth uh, from between 3D and 2D. So we're kind of building sort of a, a early phase BIM in, in Rhino. I think you can kind of see the stacking, how it moved them into 3D there in the speckle view as well. Yeah, exactly. Imagine them extruded. Yeah, you you yeah. have the kind of stacking of them. Yeah, exactly. So you get a sense of the connectivity and the, the course and the stat functions in the, in the building. Yeah. Um, then I think we will jump into showing the dashboard because you have seen the uh, different pieces of the dashboard so far. And if you look into, um, let's see if I can find it. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, hold on one sec. Because we have uploaded the dashboard to Food for Rhino yesterday, and it's on uh, pack, uh, what is called Package Manager. And if you just search for uh, Link Dashboard, you should be able to find it. Let me just see if I can find the example yeah. file. I can uh, just I have it here. meanwhile yeah. share the, some of the stuff you can do within Rumulator. So yeah. it's we only saw the space planning now, but of, of course, when you have done the space planning, you can start to do analysis on it. And uh, here we are looking at uh, like deviations from the room program. So since it's connected to an Excel, you can see, is this room big enough? Is it small? Smaller than necessary? And we can start to map that out. And here we can see the 3D structure below uh, or to the side. So we can all the time kind of compare and see that the values are good. And uh, from this, if we just build a simple shell, we can start to see the connectivity. If this is, a, this is the like, break room for the nurses, then how long does it take to go from room A to break room? And is that optimized? Should we do something else? And it's really, since we're doing this in Grasshopper, we can connect it with all this cool stuff, you know, uh, start to do like small scale or urban analysis basically on this to see how the actual hospital would work. And that's, uh, this is kind of the 3D model uh, trying to genetically adapt itself to fit the best. Yeah. That is really cool. OK, um, I just found the uh, example file. Apologies for that. So if you download the dashboards, so this is what we are sharing. So if you download the dashboard on, on Food for Rhino, you'll, uh, there'll also be an example file included. And some of the stuff you can do with that is creating a dashboard item. So you can list in a bunch of uh, names and values, and you can see them immediately into the 
uh, Rhino viewport. And all of these dashboard items, they can be customized. So you can change the colors, text color, and so on. And you can also set different descriptions. So when we have the mouse over, you can see where do the people in Link.io actually origin from. So you see we're also very diverse backgrounds. Not only are we spread all over Scandinavia, but we also come from all over the world. And if we want to nest it, you basically just connect one dashboard item into sub items from another dashboard item. So this will give you the main dashboard item here called people. That's the one up here. You can double click it and you can find the stuff inside it. And on this one over here, you can always turn it off, hide it, whatever. And you can sort of preset if you want an item to show its um, sub items by default. You can turn it off, but you can still double click up here. If you want to add some geometry to the dashboard item, you can just see in the Rhino viewport here. Uh, hold on a sec. I have just listed in a little bar graph showing our ages. And then each one of these BRFs go into the dashboard item. Right now, the a, a preview geometry is a list input and everything is item input. So that allows us to add more than one piece of geometry to each item, but it also means that if you're doing several items, you would need to graft uh, the inputs. But when you do this, you can then highlight here and look at each item individually. You can set the mesh transparency. I'll show that. Uh, yeah, I'll do it here. So now they're more transparent. And you can also add the combined group of BRIPs to the, um, let's say, parent dashboard. That's what we're previewing here. So I'm linking all of the BRIPs into the parent one, and then each one of the BRIPs into the uh, nested ones. We can also preview uh, the dashboard uh, item param here. And if you want to bake that, you see that all of the names are added to Rhino together with the geometry. That's pretty cool, I think. If you want to do it a little more complex, then um, here we are tweaking. We're showing how you can do a dashboard item just by using data trees. So we have two inputs in each, and then we're feeding it into another dashboard that has two items. So this way, we're creating two dashboard items here, animals and plants. And they have the sub-items, bird, dog, tree, bush, and so on. And if you want to join that together with the people one we had from before, then if you combine everything, you get planet, right? Animals, plants, and people, then we're almost there. We can also show um, meshes with uh, vertex colors. This is typically if you have a let's say a daylight simulation or something like that from honeybee or ladybug and, and you have a simulation mesh with some results on, then you can see here I have um, a colored mesh. This is not a simulation. This is a really bad example to do a planet Earth. But if you link that up to dashboard item here, then you also see that when you mouse over on that one. So you can also have different simulation results and you can mouse over and see the different results in, in uh, Rhino. We have the um, we have the show values here, which is basically just saying if you want to see the value here in, in in the end, and you can type in your own units and you can choose how many decimals you want to show. So if you round it to minus decimals, it's basically rounding for each ten, a hundred, or thousand. So that's a good little trick to put it into minus. And if you want to set different targets, then we have what we call a dashboard target. So this is a, a 
target we call old. So if our age is more than 35, no offense, 21, then you are old. So this thing will be shown as green if we meet our targets and red if we don't. And if you want to play with how that can look, if you want to visualize different metrics, we can say if you add some, some age to people, you can say, let me just maybe... Uh, I'll just, where's the properties here? I'll just scale it a little bit up. Okay. Ah, okay, yeah, one second. So at the moment, we both have an internal and external dashboard, and they are not compliant. Scale. There we go. So if you add eight to people, you can see that this little dashboard target, the little green one, is changing. Another thing we can look at is the settings here for the dashboard properties. And you can control the overall width of it, scale, of course, text size, and so on. And uh, we have something called frame, which if you want them to be the line height to be really high. You can set the padding off, and you can you can actually set it all the way to zero. Let's just put it to zero. And you can choose if you want some offset here. Yeah. Background opacity. So I think it's a, we created a very, very generic tool here that no matter how you use Rhino, if it's an architecture or engineering or whatnot, you can sort of preview your different proposals. It, we also have in, um, our internal one, a way we can add different events to if you right click, that's something we will uh, further develop and see how we can publish also. Um, we use it in our own, in the EP tools. So for some special objects, you can right click and there's a new uh, method added to it. You can also uh, do it as a, let's say a, a preset uh, legend. So if you have a legend with Daylight results, and you want to show the area above uh, a daylight factor or sunlight hours or whatever. Uh, you could actually have sort of a preset. You could put this stuff into a cluster, and and you can have your pre legend up here, and then right click and say select those items. Because if again, as we saw in the first example, you can assign different um, geometries to it. Maybe on the geometry node, I didn't show that you can also. I showed you can bake from this one, right? But you can also bake here. So you can say zoom in viewport. You can also say select in grasshopper. So if, if, if you have a lot of these uh, set up and you can't remember where does this one come from, just uh, select in grasshopper. Um, and you can bake it here. At the moment, we have, have two different bake methods, which I know is kind of stupid. But yeah, use the one over here if you want the text object to be included together with it. If you want to cache, cast it, you, I think you can cast it to a mesh also here. Yeah, so if you want some preview directly here from Rhino also when you're not mouse over, you can do that. Uh, is there anything I missed here? No, right clicking. Yeah, one thing, um, if you want to move the dashboard, you can right click here and say set anchor. You just put it over here. That's pretty cool. Or you can of course also reset it. Um, I think that was it for the uh, dashboards. Um, let's just see if we have some final notes, Fabian, because I see we also nearing the end of the uh, time slot here. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. I. So this is the uh, uh, internal one. Yeah. No, no, no. Go on. And we touched a little bit on, on our tech stack. And um, we're doing a lot of climate analysis that we didn't show at all. So we are using SimScale and Climate Studio and, and Honeybee Ladybug. And all of these things, I think, is, uh, let's say, uh, supercharged when it comes to outputs, when you use the dashboard plugin. 
Um, and as final notes, we have actually for the, let's say the internal tool, we have an API documentation that is actually public. So if you want to sneak around what our methods do, you can do it in this link. But it's, I mean, you're not able to download that plugin. Um, so we touched upon the internal tool. And then let's say the gift for everyone, just to clarify once again, is the uh, is the dashboard. And uh, if any of you out there are bright students, then we're also looking for some awesome interns. And uh, we promised you uh, that it would be at least as fun as uh, the senior architect sitting down here. So. Uh, don't uh, don't hesitate to send us an application and uh, be part of all the fun. Um, yeah, so that's what we touched upon today. And did I miss anything, Fabian? No, no, I don't think so. I think no. you recapped the um, the dashboards perfectly. Really good. I mean, then we'll have time for questions. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it's been amazing. I think you answered most of the questions, but we have some here at the last moment. Uh, so, for example, Michel Pescator is asking if uh, it's possible to use this uh, link dashboard like uh, UI in combination with Rhino Insight to display all this stuff in Revit. I think it's possible. The, 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 the graphical overview doesn't work inside Revit, I think. I don't think you can run it in... in, in Grasshopper and then preview it in Revit. But if you use Rhino inside Revit to get all of your BREPs into Rhino, you can use it as sort of a a more advanced uh, schedule inside Rhino. Yeah, you can take the geometry from Revit and watch it in, in Rhino, right? Yeah. And we have another one from Lodovico Bruno that is saying well, that he's going to, to use this tomorrow because he's working on a similar problem, uh, project with this type of controls. So let's see what he thinks about that. Um, a lot of congratulations and that sport is pretty cool. And I think I saw another one. If you will consider to doing a, we a webinar for the climate and dashboard stuff, yeah, we could. I mean, to be honest, we, we, we've, we've shown, let's say, the dashboard. This is a Lego brick. This is not, not a Lego brick. This is how you connect them. And then it's, I would say, very much up to your own imagination how you combine them. Um, I think the first part of our webinar today showed a little bit of inspiration, but you should not feel limited to that. OK, thank you. And Alejandro Pacheco is asking if these tools, um, is you using them or is there the architects at link also using them we uh we are uh, we have this uh, influencer network i showed in the start where we have different to say ambassadors and all of our offices uh preaching people to use this um but we've had a big milestone around this webinar and we have a let's say an internal relaunch of everything next week now that everything has been connected so um, but but it's available for everyone in the company. But but we haven't implemented to as many as as we we'd wished. But uh, all of our let's say specialists they use it, and a few others also. Um, especially the the simplicity of getting the areas of the buildings and show that in the Rhino viewport. You can do that in three components in Grasshopper. Yeah. So even even people who are afraid of Grasshopper uh, can do that. And and we actually also have an internal uh, uh, Rhino plug-in, but it's not as far as, as the Grasshopper stuff here. The, the, the thing is that the more, uh, let's say, if you have a script with a lot of components, the more you boil it down to a few components and you have the code of those components, the closer you are to just directly implementing it into a, a Rhino uh, a plug-in. Yeah, thank you. We are already using it in some of the smaller scale urban projects and also the Elias Randa, which is a one point one million. It's yeah. a big one. <laughs> it's as big as they get. And we, so I think people are starting to use it, uh, but it's when when they are in that scale, it, it's hard for. Um, uh, then you kind of need to be a specialist to set it up, so it doesn't become too much. But for the smaller ones, everybody can set it up, and I think some people have. Yeah, thank you. And I think, for example, with the example of 
a link dashboard, it's really easy to, to start with it and to understand the commands. So that's great. Um, I'm seeing a lot more questions right now. Um, yeah, Ludovico is asking again if are you going to develop some controls on the camera linked to the dashboard, like zooming on the selected object from the dashboard? I think you showed that. Before. Yeah, we have that. Yeah. 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 There was a comment before I see about linking it to BIM software. Um, yeah. I've been using the dashboards on on a, the, the national hospital in Oslo, where we linked all the building, all the rooms with uh, Rhino inside, and then we coupled up with uh, the Rufus, which has uh, many of our room programs in an external database. And then I did sort of a word search for uh, different types of rooms that, according to the room program, does not need daylight, but I would say would still benefit. That could be corridor or waiting room and stuff like that. And then we visualized it in in Rhino with the dashboards, and you can highlight and find all the rules, all the rooms. Sorry. And it's really easy to to say when you make a dashboard item, you want it, the name of that based on the uh, on 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 the name of the room. And you we have it coupled up with with Speckle because a lot of our our colleagues, especially in Norway, are using Archicad, and our colleagues in in, in Denmark are using uh, Revit. So we're mm -hmm. kind of using everything at once. Yeah. And that's that. a, a bit of the idea behind the web app and speckle and connecting to that mm -hmm. everything that we're developing so that we can always get everything like similarly processed. Great. Um let's see if I don't miss anyone. Uh, Our backgrounds, yeah. we are yeah. we are all architects, exactly. and I have sort of a hybrid, but but we are all architects, and, and let's say all the C sharp coding fun is uh, reading on the Rhino Common SDK, and uh, yeah, spending a lot of evenings watching YouTube tutorials, and yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, how many hours did you need to make those tools? I think it's a hard one. It's uh, a number we should know. I could say it's 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 secret, but we don't don't actually know because it's being like co-developed. We have uh, Fabian and I have been doing a lot of them. Then we have Michael who is part time on it. Uh, we have Paul who's done the uh, room relator part, part. We have Yu Wei who's also chipping in. We have uh, Oscar who's been doing icons. It's a big uh, team effort, and for our interns, for instance. There's a big to-do list and stuff they can do on this if, if they're not busy on projects. And for ourselves, we do the stuff we kind of need to do because there's a project that needs it or there's a, a deadline like this uh, webinar. So in that sense, we had some things, some of the hours on projects, some of the hours on, let's say, in, in internal development uh, uh, projects. So, so yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, to count all of them. But and, and and we didn't show everything we have in Link EP mm -hmm. right now, but I think in, in man hours that's that's probably one year of man hours. Yeah. Of all of our development. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a question about the room later. Is the placement of the room blocks into a floor plan automated or is this manual done by the architect? Yeah, I probably didn't show that too well, but it first it generates this table where it just sorts them by, let's say, whatever data you have in your Excel. Mm -hmm. And then you can either choose to drag and drop all the curves and do your plan, but you could also start drawing in 2D your own plan only with curves. As long as you drag the room tag that room relator did into that curve, it will match the zone from Excel with that curve and check if the areas are okay. So as long as the room tag being just a regular Rhino text element is in your curve, and that, that room tag, it's not showing the text of your room ID, but it has a, let's say, a Rhino name of the GUID, and that way it's matched. So you could change the text, and it will still be matched because the GUID is saved as a user, uh, what's it called, user string. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think the last questions are about, again, how to learn to code, and that it's great to see architect taking on some serious software development. So, uh, I mean, it's it, it's it's not a secret that us developing this is something that our management is also like, why don't you just buy SpaceMaker? But we see SpaceMaker and lots of other developments being done in a way where you 
kind of want to show it before you can do it, especially when you look at startups. Now SpaceMaker is really good, so let's not talk about the specific company, but there's a lot of st startups that show much more than they can. And that's why it's been important for us also today to do it as sort of a live demo, because we don't want to say, oh, we have a AI, blah, 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 because, I mean, we are not there. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, yeah. An important, we, yeah, sorry. An important part all the time has been that we can connect to those tools. That's yeah. kind of what EP is, the, the like glue that binds them together and visualize and do some uh, do analysis. So I think that's it, it's really nice to have that all the time as well so that we know what we're outputting and inputting. Okay, guys, so uh, I think it's a bit late already. So I don't know if you want to comment anything else. If not, I will... Thank you again for doing this presentation and for all the effort in the plugin. It has been great to see how, how you combine all these plugins in your own workflow and how you use Grasshopper and Rhino and yeah, use it for, for real run scale for architecture. It's great. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's, yeah. a, You're welcome. it's a pleasure. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have a bit more questions, but if you can ask uh, in youtube i can answer them later but i will try to to copy them and answer you by email also if it's possible if not we can stay here forever <laughs> thank you everyone goodbye thank you have a nice bye. Evening. Bye. bye bye